you know, and, and ramen is like, it's like a regional food. Depending on what part of Japan you go, you'll get a very different style of ramen based on the climate,、uh, it's what's available, right? What, what, the, what the people enjoy. And so, even when I go to Japan, there's so much to learn. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Sun noodles are legends in the ramen game and the company behind many of your favorite bowls around the country. Kenshiro Uki, our guest on today's show, grew up in Hawaii working at his family's noodle company and later helped lead an expansion through the United States and beyond. On this episode, we hear about what goes into making noodles perfectly matched for legendary shops like Momofuku Noodle Bar and Yuji Ramen, to name a few. We also hear about Sun's growing CPG business, which brings bowls of miso and shoyu ramen to home cooks everywhere. It's super interesting catching up with Kenshiro, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Kenshiro Uki, welcome to This is Taste. How are you doing? Awesome, man. Thank you for having me here, Matt.、I'm、What?、Excited. This is going to be a great conversation. I, I feel Sun Noodle、uh, is truly a gold standard in, in all food, not just in ramen. I mean, it's really just a product that many of our listeners stand behind. You got your instant kits, you got your collaborations, places like Momofuku with UG, with Ivan Ramen. You got so many things going on. So, this is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really a blessing. You know, I think these、uh, opportunities to share our story. Um, it's a dream because you know, coming out of Hawaii,、uh, you know, humble factory, humble, humble beginnings, and, and getting to, to be here in, in, your, in your office and talk about our story. I mean, that's just、uh, an amazing feeling. So, thank you. Well, you're welcome. It's, it's a long time coming. And, you know, ramen is an interesting product because, you know, there's been a modern history with ramen. If you go back even 10 years, but definitely 20 years, For most people, ramen was the dehydrated packages like、sure. Shin Ramen or just you know, any brand of dehydrated noodles you would put in hot water and boiled. But obviously, now in 2024, we're in an era where everyone knows that they like their Masaman over their Shio and they also have the ramen emoji, which is not the dehydrated noodles. It is actually a bowl of well composed ramen with bamboo shoots and、uh, an egg and all that. You've been here, you've been with your family. This is like part of your story. Is it kind of remarkable about the rise of ramen? Yeah, you know, I think it's been a, it's an incredible, you know, incredible journey just to see how、uh, America has accepted、uh, this call it movement of what we call craft ramen. And if you go back to,、uh, let's just say, Japan and where they started with、uh, what we're enjoying today, right? It's that beautifully crafted soup. A、hearty broth,、uh, fresh noodles, and, and like you said, bamboo and memma and toppings that, that they make. And then in the early 1900s,、uh, Momofuku Ando created and invented instant ramen because of、uh, you know, hard times during, after the war.、Uh, and, and so you, you've seen that evolution in, in Japan, but in the US, it feels like it was a reverse, right? Where people、uh, know, or the majority of people know more about instant ramen. Uh, that's what they ate you know, when they were younger or、uh, throughout you know, college,、uh, which was affordable, it was、uh, approachable. And now you're seeing the movement from instant ramen to then becoming、uh, what these restaurants are, are producing out throughout the country、uh, amazing bowls of, of, of ramen. I think that、uh, you know, coming from Hawaii, I think we were maybe a little bit different where you, you, we had a lot more ramen shop because of our. Population of you know, a lot more Japanese immigrants、uh, in Hawaii. So I kind of grew up around、uh, these opportunities to eat more ramen, but seeing it here today, you know, New York City,、uh, LA, all over the country,、uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. And there's I, I, so much to love about a bowl of composed ramen. It doesn't have to be tonkatsu. It doesn't have to be rich. It can be light.、Exactly. It doesn't have to have meat in it. It can be vegan,、mm-hmm. amazing vegan ramen.、Um, and so there's multitudes these days, and it's, it's, It's as exciting as ever. I mean, there was probably a moment when they said ramen was a trend, but you probably don't have a lot to say about that one. Well, yeah, I think、uh, if, it, if it was a trend, it wasn't going to be good for Sun Noodle. And so, <laughs> you know, we, we, we wanted to make sure that、um, this amazing food that we could connect、uh, Japan and the US through a beautiful bowl of ramen was not going to be a trend. And, and so,、uh, 
but there's everything to love about ramen. You, you mentioned it's comforting, it's uh, it's affordable, or it's delicious, it's fulfilling, it, it makes people happy. Uh, there's tonkotsu, right, which is a creamy style. There's also the, the lighter styles of shoyu and shiu, and so it's really accessible to anyone and everyone. And I th I think that's why. Uh, we're seeing just a vast majority of ramen shops opening throughout the country. Uh, and then we're seeing it accepted by so many people of different age groups. And oh, yeah. It's just really amazing to see that. Well, let's talk about the sun noodle and the, the scale. I mean, you've got factories in Hawaii, California, New Jersey, and the Netherlands, mm -hmm. and you're sold in over 20 countries. So let's get into, like, how do you describe the size of your company now? One, I think we're, we're just always humbled and blessed. I, I think we... You know, it's it's all about uh, for my father. He's always shared with with myself. It's uh, you know we have to go and build um, the category. We have to go and uh, share our passion uh, of ramen for for many more people. So the first twenty years uh, from nineteen eighties to early two thousands, it was fully focused on Hawaii, building the foundation, and you know people of Hawaii accepted him to open his business, taking a chance on on his products, uh, and then a customer of his out of Hawaii, wanted to open in, in Orange County, California. And so we were shipping products from Hawaii uh, for some time. And it, you know, at some point, it just didn't make sense yeah, economically. economically right. And so that restaurant owner invited my father to visit him. And my father went and ate at so many restaurants. And you know, every bowl of ramen was delicious. But what he did mention was that every noodle seemed like it was all the same. So he thought that there was a chance to do something, uh, bring his craft of... Uh, the different styles of noodles that could match the restaurant soup. And so in 2003, we opened in California. Uh, and then the same opportunity to come out east in 2012 and uh, just last year opening a factory in the Netherlands. And so it's just amazing to see that, uh, you know, this, this simple product that we make is loved by, by so many people in different countries or they speak different languages, oh, yeah. uh, different backgrounds. <laughs> Uh, but but to your point, I think that's why ramen is not trendy. You know, it, it's there to stay because it can be incorporated uh, locally uh, to each people's favorite liking. Well, Ken, we'll get into like how the bespoke nature of the of the ramen business and how you work with you know operators and chefs uh, and you create you know unique ramen noodles for their their broth and their and their restaurants. But uh, you just said 2012, which is an important year. Um, you know, in New York, you entered the, the 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 scene and you started working with some pretty big names. Momofuku Noodle Bar was probably the top of the heap, and David Chang and you have a long history. But you also work with like Ivan Orkin, Ivan Ramen, Yuji Ramen, which is like mm -hmm. definitely one of my favorites. And I feel like when Sun kind of entered New York, you got like Dave and Ivan talking about you, and then all of a sudden it was like you had to have Sun to be in the game. What was twelve like for you? <laughs> yeah, that I've never uh, I've never heard anyone say it in, in that way, but but it, it's really special what, you know, if, if you think about it in that sense. And twenty twelve, uh, let's just you know, maybe back up a little bit. I I, I joined my father's company in two thousand eight and, and worked at a California factory where he had just built or expanded his business uh, for for more footprint, and uh, that's right when. One of our largest distributors picked Sun Noodle up as a supplier, mm. and so for the first time, we were going to get to go from uh, a California Los Angeles DSD model to now have products of Sun Noodles go cross country to New York City. And uh, my my first two three years was learning how to make noodles and and working in the, in the factory and and doing a lot of R and D and, and production. And in two thousand and eleven, the the Asia Society had an event called the Ramen Fever event. Mm. And, uh, and and so I was excited because I've never been to New York uh, for business prior to that. Uh, and got to come a few days earlier to to eat at a lot of different ramen shops and, and try a different types of ramens and, and get to meet so many people. But uh, but the, the reaction when I introduced myself was so negative. You know, I think the perception that they had uh, of Sun Noodle was so uh, negative. Negative? Not <laughs> shocking to me. Like, what's negative about it? In Hawaii and in Los Angeles at that time, we were very good at making noodles today and then delivering it tomorrow. You know, DSD, in, in terms of getting our products uh, to many, many restaurants directly from our from our factory. And 
And what we did not know was in New York, the differences of a noodle being distributed fresh, refrigerated versus frozen. And uh, we, we had just made the products like they would be delivered freshly, but we then distribute it frozen through through pallets. and I see where this is going. Uh, and, there's and, issues. There's trucks. Exactly. 3,000 miles between yeah. L.A. and New York. And there's temperature changes yeah. in the summer and, and winter. And and so the restaurants had a right to be very, uh, you know, just not excited to see, to see me when I when I came by. They were crushed <laughs> noodles or melted noodles or all stuck together. Uh, and, and Matt, I think that's seeing that uh, lit a fire in me, right? Because in, in Hawaii, our, our perception or, or the brand is, is so strong. And, you know, I had this kind of uh, maybe will to just want to figure out how, how can I change this perception about them? And so fast forward to 2012, uh, my father let me come out here and uh, and we built a very small, call it production room yeah. in, in Teterboro. And and I just knocked on doors and I, and I think about Dave, uh, back then, and, and Ivan Orkin and, and Yuji, uh, all these people, and many more who, who gave us a chance, right? Who, who gave us a chance to give them some samples or, or let us uh, you know, be in the kitchen to provide some art, uh, you know, back and forth. You and, started working with them directly to create bespoke noodles, like ones that they actually wanted for them specifically. Yes. And I'm sure to them, that was a major opportunity, right? Sure. To be able, because like before they were likely using you know, more of a commodity noodle that was probably made somewhere in like big batches. Yeah. I mean, now you make it in huge batches, but I mean, it's not even about the sizes, but you were knocking doors and getting the recipes right. The restaurant or the ramen scene in New York City was so at a, at a high level Yeah, that the quality was was amazing. And there, there was a short list of ramen shops that I said, I really want to get into. I'm going to get some Minka's on there. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Minka. Is Minka on there? Because Minka was like the number one. For me. Mr. Kamada, Kamada-san, uh, he is the one that I went to first. And I was 24 at that time. And I kept on knocking on his door. Uh, I, I knew what time he was coming in every morning, 9.30 on his bicycle. I was always there at 9.15. And uh, you know, just kept on asking him for feedback. You know, he had a he had a supplier for for many many uh, years. As I was speaking to him, and and you think about his loyalty to his his partners, and I just wanted to get just one chance to see if he could sample it, and maybe because I was younger, uh, and maybe because I was willing to come in and and meet with him every day, is that after the fifteenth try, he put me on his summer menu. Oh wow! Uh, for his cold noodle dish and. Uh, but it's people like them who, yeah. you know, give you a chance. And obviously his perception, I think, 15 tries before was very negative and, and you know, had bad experiences. And so they didn't want to waste his time. And then uh, giving me that chance. So Mr. Kamada at Minka and, you know, there's so many other places that uh, have helped us kind of, you know, build build a relationship and uh, along along the journey. Uh, I mean, what a journey it's been. And, and we'll get into a little more of this craftsmanship, but I have some more some general ramen questions. I mean, how has our appreciation changed for ramen over the past 20 years uh, in New York as, as ramen? Because you, you're right, 2012 was a high level, but really I think 2024 is at the highest level. But how, you know, it used to just be like one or two styles, but now it's like kind of multitudes. Yeah, I would say probably the, the, the very dominant one was tonkotsu. Uh, yeah. And I think maybe we made some... Improvement there because, you know, at, at one period, people were calling it tonkatsu ramen yeah. and, you know, now people are calling it tonkotsu, which is correct. And, yeah. you know, it, but you, you see uh, not just in terms of how many shops have opened up in the city, uh, but the, the, the difference in variety. Uh, we have obviously the ramen, uh, skemen, the dipping noodle, the mazemen that mm-hmm. Yuji does so well and others. And uh, you just see the evolution there and, and then people just being comfortable using chopsticks yep, and yep. slurping. Great and, point, great point. And, and things like that. So, uh, you know, I know Ipudo did something really early on that was really interesting is they actually made their noodles shorter than they would do in Japan. So it's easier for, for uh, people to eat and little things like that that restaurants have done over the years to to make ramen approachable and also just evolve uh, the, the flavor profile. So it's... Yeah, it's amazing. I think when I first moved out here in 2012, there was probably 15 ramen shops at that time. And today there's over 150. Wow. So that's been amazing. What do you what do you say to somebody when they call you and they're like, Ken, I want to open a ramen shop? And let's not say New York because it's a unique market and real estate's crazy. But like a random city, what like what do you tell them? 
Um, are you going to make money in ramen? Are you are you going to crush it in ramen? Like, I mean, a lot of people dream of open restaurants. Ramen is probably one of the everyone dreams about. But what's, what do you tell them? I would first ask them, you know, what what's the vision? Like, what is the goal for, for your ramen shop? Because we get a variety. We get a lot of different inquiries, whether one wants to just scale ramen shops or one just really wants that one shop that he does everything himself or herself. And, and so we, we asked that question first because that will really uh, allow us to think about how do we approach uh, the, the next questions and next steps, right? It's, uh, and what kind of noodles do we pair with it? But we really asked what part of, of that ramen uh, are, are they wanting to do? I, I some of them are very inspired by a mm -hmm. trip to Japan. Some may have just left working at a ramen shop and want to do their own. Uh, and so it's really asking like, what is uh, the opportunity uh, and from there, we 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 really want to hone in on like what style, what, what style of ramen you know, do you want to make? Um, we are big believers in in this craft ramen movement, and I and I take that from whether it's third wave coffee or craft brewery and things like that, where you respect and honor the traditional techniques and foundation of what makes a great bowl of ramen: the five elements, right? Uh, a beautiful broth, delicious noodles that pairs with it toppings that match it, uh, or aromatic oils that elevate the bowl of ramen. And, and then from there, it's it's really asking, are you trying to mimic something that you, you were inspired in Japan? Or are you going to use local yeah. ingredients? And, and it gets really exciting from there about how Sun can be a, a partner of theirs to, to make that dream come true. Is but, it tough to open a ramen shop? Is it is it like really hard work? You know, we had Ramen Lab back in the days, and I I would just say any kind of restaurant Oh, we'll <laughs> get there. So we'll, hard. we'll talk about Ramen Lab. I'm, I really, yeah. really miss that place. Um, but I... You know, the restaurant industry is is, is so, uh, I just give them so much credit. I, I don't, you know, I, I think you have to have so much passion. You have to have so much grit to be successful. And so whether it's one ramen shop or multiple ramen shops, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult because I would say ramen is probably 90% prep. And and then when, when the order comes in, it's, it's kind of like you know, heating it up and, and preparing it. But 20 hours of making uh, pork stock or chicken stock and you know, hours of, of making the perfect egg and, and toppings and then making sure that uh, you have right enough for for the next day in, in terms of the people coming in. It's just a lot of back and work that I think more people would appreciate uh, seeing from these restaurants. And then what what you get served is is a very simple comforting dish. And But there's a lot of work behind it. Yeah. yeah. And also just, of course, getting your noodles right. You know, <laughs> getting the right noodles in there. And let me ask you, if, if you end up you know, working with somebody, they're like, okay, they are going to open the place or maybe they already have places, but they're like, we need a specific noodle. We need something that is really going to work with our, you know, yuzu broth or or whatever it may be, shoyu broth. How do you ideate with the restaurant? Because I know that's a big part of Sun is mm -hmm. like matching it. Is it like, how do you do the tastings? Like, do you like show up at the restaurant and help them? Like, what's the deal with that? I've been working for my father now for 14 years. And as, as much as you try to make it very scientific, it, it's so much art. And it, it also, it's highly dependent on, on that chef because uh, he or she has a very specific, uh, probably uh, imagination of, of what that looks like. And and I've been fortunate to be able to develop uh, a lot of noodles for restaurants. And what makes it very challenging is that you can't always describe it in words. It, it's a feeling that you, you have to go back and forth. And and so uh, if a restaurant owner or a chef knows exactly what uh, texture or, or, or flavor profile or um, you know length and cut and chewiness and thickness, then that, call it goal point, makes it a little bit easier for us to kind of focus on. Um, and so like Ivan Orkin, he he was making noodles in Japan for years, and so he knew how uh, different flowers and different water ratios work for for a noodle. And so that was, I wouldn't say easy, but it was much more of a smoother kind of R and D process because we'd go back and forth, and we know what we're talking about. But if and we have other uh, really awesome opportunities where they are just inspired by this one ramen shop that they got mm -hmm. to visit, whether it's somewhere in the U.S. or or Japan or elsewhere. And, and the, the very specific is, I, I want that noodle. We, we we go out and we eat at that restaurant. And if we've never made it before, we will go out there and we'll try it out. And we'll try to figure out what, what is that. You'll do a reverse engineer for them. We will. Yeah. And my father is, is if not the best, um, we have about two or three other people that is capable of, of going out there and trying it and mimicking it. But 
it's it's vast. It's it's very dependent on on what that uh, chef uh, is envisioning. I mean, let me ask you: You're American. You grew up in Hawaii. Uh, your clients are in the United States as well. Are you in Japan a lot? What's your relationship with Japan? Is Sun in Japan? Would Sun want to be in Japan? Yeah, if we if we go back to my grandfather's uh, generation, you know, my grandfather was in the noodle business as well. Uh, he he is uh, a mastermind at, at making noodles. And when I was uh, early earlier in my career making noodles at the factory, uh, I would go to him for a lot of advice. I guess our roots are in Japan. Uh, my father came to Hawaii when he was 19 to start his business, uh, and and so I am uh, Japanese American, and I'm really blessed because uh, growing up in Hawaii, you have that diverse culture. And sure. you know, my my father's always said, "Ken, you know, this business I can take it from you know what I know in my language and my craft, but you're American, and so go spread this love to people who speak your language, right. and, and go share this craft." And so, yeah, it's a uh, I, I was in Japan last month for 24 hours. Uh, 24 hours? What are you, <laughs> Ken, what are you doing, man? We're, we're in Tokyo, Hokkaido? Where are we at? Well, it's crazy because I had to go to Okinawa, yeah. which is the southern part of Japan, yeah. and Tokyo. And I flew for 26 and I was there for 24. But if there's anywhere I would go for 24 hours, I, it would be Japan. And I, I was out there because a customer is about to open in the US and he and he really wanted to meet about some samples. And I started, brought it to him. We tasted it together in Okinawa. And he's uh, he's approved them for Amazing. his opening. So that's really great customer yeah. service, <laughs> and a lot of jet lag. <laughs> Amazing, and, and a very supportive wife. <laughs> yeah, you have two. You have some small small ones at home. Yeah. So yeah, yeah you got to be. You know, your travel is not as easy. Yeah, yeah. And you have a very supportive wife. Very, very cool. supportive. Shout her out. Yeah. <laughs> um. So you, you you have like your your father was born in Japan. So you have this link to Japan, and um, you are there. Like I do an R and D like like in the shops because like Japan is where the trends start right and where we, we ended up getting those trends in America exactly I think ramen started in China and it was brought to Japan and through the Yokohama port and um, you know it was, I think at one point it was only served to the the upper class and it became then open to the masses but. We we go to we go to Japan where it's the most competitive place. There's thirty thousand ramen shops uh, in Japan, and um, you know we go out there because there's always something to learn. You know, and and ramen is like it's like a regional food. Yeah. So it's like pizza oh, or yeah. barbecue here in the U.S. Where depending on what part of Japan you go, you get a very different style of ramen based on yeah maybe it's the the climate. Uh, it's what's available, right? What what the what the people enjoy, and so even when I go to Japan, there's so much to learn. And we also send our R and D. We bring our R and D team to Japan at least once every two years, mm-hmm. and we go and learn the different t- styles of flour that that's available, the mixing techniques. Um, we we work closely with our supplier out there for wheat, and we were actually invited to to visit the the factory that makes the noodles for one of my favorite ramen shops in in Tokyo mm. um, the son of <laughs> there's a lot of amazing noodle makers yeah, but yeah. Uh, there's a there's a ramen shop called Tomita and if you ever watched the movie ramen heads uh, this is the guy that's in it but they taught us how they make their noodles and it was completely different in approach and process than how we make some of our products. But we were inspired by that. Uh, and now we're doing a lot of R&D around. That's around pretty cool that, that they opened up uh, their, their business and let you, yeah. and let you mm-hmm. in. And, and that's very collaborative. Yeah. But Matt, I would just say, you know, I think it's interesting because 20 years ago, when you think about shoyu ramen, you think, okay, immediately pair that with medium chewy, yellow, wavy noodles. Tonkotsu would be uh, married with a low moisture, snappy noodle. And today I was in Japan and there is now shoyu ramen paired with low moisture noodles. And it's completely different from what we thought would be a blank canvas 20 years ago to what people are doing today. Is that like, so, Gen, is that like Gen Z? It's, it's like, amazing. I don't like know Gen what's going on. Going, <laughs> trying to just throw everything on its head. But it's amazing to see the evolution. Even what we thought was probably traditional is is being challenged in Tokyo. And so a lot of inspiration in Japan there. 
I love. I want to. I want to ask you about your favorite styles. Like we're gonna. We're gonna just go there. I do have a favorite, uh, and it's one that I grew up eating. And I think that's very nostalgic. It's it's a Sapporo style miso ramen, and a Sapporo style is a very distinct style where they use a wok, right? So they use a wok, and they stir fry the vegetables, the meat, uh, and they put the miso paste and put the soup in the wok. So it's super aromatic. It's super flavorful. There's so much going on, and they pour it over extremely yellow and chewy noodles, and that's what I grew up eating、uh, in Hawaii. That's where my father would take us on Sundays, and so today,、um, if there is one that I could just eat just because of personal time, not because of work, but just because I want to、yeah. get out there and eat something, it, it's always going to be a Sapporo miso ramen. Does somebody in the states do a version that's close enough for you? They do.、Uh, th- there are yes.、Uh, there's a lot in Los Angeles. Uh, there's actually one that just opened up in Chicago, which shout it out, yeah. man! Yeah, so Ramen Lord, I think it's called Akahoshi Ramen now.、Yeah. Uh, he was、uh, he was always doing ramen pop ups. Yeah, but he he fell in love with Sapporo because I think he went to school there,、mm-hmm. and, and now opened up his restaurant.、Uh, there is one here called Menko Isato、uh, in New York City. Not a customer, but I'm a huge fan of, of what they do,、uh, and and they actually do very traditional. Uh, styles of of Sapporo miso ramen, so yeah, things like、uh, that style I love. I、uh, my favorite. I was also in Hokkaido in Hokkaido. I had a a shio ramen that to me was like the best ramen I've ever had. So clean and just really、um, what I wanted that day. I guess the day was quite cold. I didn't want anything too you know seasoned. Perfect. And that's that's the beauty because depending、right. on how you're feeling and depending on where you're at, like I think you. There's just a, a variety of options that's available for 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 how you're feeling. So, yeah,、uh, I mean, Ramen Lab. I think I went like three times,、oh, thank and、you. there was all these cool pop ups. I mean, it was like this moment in New York. What happened with Ramen Lab? <laughs> will it come back? COVID. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. COVID is the reason. I mean, will it come back? Uh, not anytime soon. It's not in our plans. You know, I think the 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 whole goal of Ramen Lab. Uh, at that time in 2015, when we opened, was to expose the different styles of ramen available, and, and it, it started because the majority of people thought ramen equaled tonkotsu、yeah. or pork.、And、good job, Apudo. No, and great, right? Because I think <laughs> they did a good job. <laughs> yeah, and we love them、uh, for what they've done with the culture. But I had a call with a restaurant owner that wanted to open a ramen shop that focused on shoyu. A very clean, clear,、uh, you know, light broth, and you know we had more restaurants like this that consumers would come in and say, "This is not ramen. This is not pork. This is, it's not ramen." And so, the ramen lab vision and the real purpose was to bring in in the first year and maybe when you're visiting, is every month a, a, a rotation of some of the best ramen shops、yeah. from Japan, and whether it be. Sapporo miso ramen style, or or tsukemen, which is a dipping noodle, or or shoyu, or just bringing the the top class ramen chefs from Japan to 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 do in New York City, and we built it within 400 square feet, standing only, open kitchen, so that people could see how much work and and how much love there is、uh, to make a bowl of ramen, and、uh, you know that 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 I think we achieved our goal. Yeah, we did it for five years. You did it for five. Wow, it was it was a great run and、Thank、so、you. many great collaborations、Thank、from、you. all over the world. Yeah, and that was, I mean that that's the that's you know one of the 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 stepping stones of of making ramen a craft ramen culture in the U.S. is just having fun with it. You know, collaborating、yeah. with awesome brands. Did it make money? Did you like actually <laughs> like did it work for you on like a PNL level? You no, know, my father and I said. The money should go to the pop up chef、yeah. because when they come out here, we want to make sure that they leave happy, and we didn't want them to lose money. So the split was more for them.、Uh, it's not we weren't losing money,、uh, but、uh, we want we always wanted the the the,、yeah. the, the guest chef to to leave and, and wanting to do more. So it was a good. I would say it was a good marketing. Marketing budget, marketing campaign for Sunday noodle. It was amazing. I think I hope you bring it back. I know it's it's hard. You got a lot of other things going on. Let me ask you about Sujita on Sautel, because like in Los Angeles, the Skumin Ramen scene started there. I guess to me, and like it blew up. It was such a big moment. 
for ramen. But like New York didn't have as much skumen. But like LA became this place where you went for this dip ramen. What does that mean to you? If you put skemen and sujita, uh, I think they're they're, they're very much um, they they brought that that style of ramen in the U.S. and they did they did it so well and. It was an eye-opening experience for me because I was at that time when they opened making the noodles for them. Uh, no way! In the cool. factory, yes. right on, and, right and, on. And you know, it's a very different noodle. It's high moisture. It's it's very sensitive, and you have to make it fresh every single day. But to imagine people eating a dipping noodle, really thick noodles, and picking it up and dipping it and then slurping it was to me like you needed someone like a Tsujita group to be able to educate. And show people how 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 to eat it, and uh, you know if you go out today in Sawtell and, it, and it's still packed, you you gotta wait to get in. And I was there last week. Okay, it was so packed. <laughs> we did not go there. You think? Okay, <laughs> it's too long a line. Yeah, but but they've they they they've brought that that style of, of ramen here in the U.S. and and they've done it so well in in Los Angeles. And you know they are making their way. I, you know they just opened in Fort Lee. Uh, they open also in Houston. Man, uh, obviously it, it's going to take some time to get people accustomed, just like it did when they first started. But some of my best friends that that's never had skemen before, all they want is uh, skemen. So you, you you know that there's people that love it. You know there's people that appreciate that rich pork uh, fish broth with the thick noodles and yeah and yeah. I'm just maybe the weather here. You know because in LA it's quite cool and you can enjoy either the ramen or or the or the skemen and. Uh, and maybe here, what, what I when I talk to the Tsujita group or you know others like Tabetomo that that does skemen, it seems like in the summertime it does really well. But yeah. like today, uh, their ramen will will outsell their their skemen. Yeah, far, yeah, yeah, so. definitely. Is there like a significant dip in like June through September on the East Coast? I would say there's a dip across the board for ramen uh, when it becomes the summertime. But at the same time, there's so many ramen shops opening, and yeah. so there's just it's it's always busy for for yeah. People. You guys are always making noodles. I mean, sure, I'm sure you have like a, you need a little bit of a break. <laughs> Ken, should we wait in line for ramen? Should we like wait an hour for ramen? Is it worth it? I'll tell you this: I, I waited three hours to you to eat ramen when I was uh, in Tokyo once, and uh, I, I had to finish in in twelve minutes to get out. <laughs> uh, so yeah. <laughs> So you're, if you're asking me uh, if it's worth it, if if the ramen shop is making a majority of their stuff in house, right, where they're spending so many hours to prepare the broth, the toppings, everything, and and you see a ramen shop that does that, I, I would say yeah, you know, give give them a chance, you know, wait an hour. Um, Put on a podcast. Appreciate you know appreciate what what they've done. Yeah. Um, but what will make the line faster is what we try to do at Ramen Lab is we make it standing only. We put a big glass window so that you feel pressure to hurry up and eat um, and have the next person enjoy wow. it. So, yeah. Uh, Brilliant. I didn't really – I love that little shop. I mean, it was like right – was it on – it wasn't on Canal. It was Kenmar? It Kenmar Street. Yeah, it was yep. on Kenmar. Yeah. yeah Kenmar. Right Mar. on – yeah, uh-huh. yeah. 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 And you were like – you got to dart – eyes were like darting at you while you were waiting there. Yeah. Okay, Ken, I put this in the prep questions when I sent it to you. So – you know this is coming, and, and I'm not going to let you get out of this question at all. Rank your top three bowls of ramen in New York City. <laughs> Matt, can I, can I maybe can I can I re- respond in a way uh, <laughs> because you know uh, Sun's here to build that craft ramen culture, and so <laughs> I, I, is get it, it, I get it. I can I can I maybe share the three maybe styles or, or shops that are doing something exciting that you cannot get anywhere else unless you come to New York City? That's it's such a more interesting question. Okay. Okay. So yes, you can. Okay. Thank you Thank for you, doing Matt. that. Thank you. You're <laughs> off the hook. You're off the hook with a better with a better question. Okay. Uh, so the triple pork, triple garlic mazamen at Ivan Ramen uh, has been there for years. It is something that I would want more people to try because it's a mazamen dish, but it hits on all the notes. It's so flavorful. It's umami packed and the thick rye noodles that comes with it, I think just puts it all together. So there's that one dish at, at Ivan Workin's uh, shop that you have to come to New York uh, to, to try. And it. over on Clinton Street. On Clinton Still Street. Still there. It's been there since it's day one. There. Yep. Love that. Rashida uh, opened Ramen by Raw in the Bowery Market. Uh, I think it's called the Bowery Market. Okay. Rashida is, uh, is amazing. I've got to meet her a few times, but she is taking her Southern cooking flair and combining that 
respectfully with the Japanese ramen uh, tradition. And she did a collard green ramen, uh, but she hits on all the notes of the broth, the toppings, the noodles, and it all works well together. And today at her shop, she does uh, a bacon, egg, and cheese breakfast ramen. That sounds really good. And a lox ramen. I'm going to try that. But so that you got to go to East Village and and you can't get it anywhere else. And and I love that. Tonchin did in Brooklyn, the pizza ramen, which you would think is... I think most other places would just put like tomato soup and noodles, and, and but but they I think they take it a different level where they have tonkotsu soup uh, blended with some tomato sauce, uh, you know their special sauce, and with the noodles they coated it with cheese. Oh uh, man! In the pan, and then they dump everything on top, uh, and it comes with like a piece of bread, and so things like that, man. I think you know, I would I would love it where one day you know because I think we are on this trajectory with these amazing ramen shops opening in the U.S. where Today, if you wanted to have traditional Hakata uh, tonkotsu ramen, you have to go to Japan. But if there is a day someday where you want that uh, ramen by raw ramen or that pizza ramen, you have to come to New York City. You have to go to Austin for, for the brisket skimming. You have to go to other places in the, whole, uh, in the U.S. to have mm-hmm. that style. That would be um, incredible. Remarkable to hear that because I think you're so right when it when you actually make destination ramen where Japanese tourists would come to get that that is a big moment for ramen and it's clearly there. Yep. There's this this uh, collard green ramen is I'm, I can't stop thinking about it. Something like Rashida you said Rashida uh, ramen by raw and I think she's an amazing and she has just a personality to to do it for for ramen here in the U S. So I'm excited about what she's doing. Have you been to Itani Ramen in Oakland? I have not been to Itani Ramen, but they've Came to Ramen Lab. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of my... I just had to shout out my friend Kyle Otani's yeah. ramen shop up in Oakland across from the Fox Theater on Telegraph. You know, it's he... It's a great shop. He gave me his renge, his spoon, oh, and, I, right. and I use it every day for <laughs> at home. It's Itani <laughs> ramen, it's his renge, and I, yeah. and I have it at home. Oh, so. that's cool to hear. Yeah. Yeah, I just had to give him a shout. We are talking about ramen. It's my favorite. He's my guy, so I had to give him a shout. Yeah, just the nicest person. He's such a nice guy. Kyle's genuine, a wonderful and, guy. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. We could talk about ramen all day. We've we've definitely talked about that. But let me close with asking you, there was another food that you could devote your life and your career to. What would that be? This may be a little boring, but you know, I I love noodles. (laughs) So um, if it wasn't ramen, I'm a huge pasta fan and and I love pasta and uh, there's just so much around pasta that I just enjoy. And so uh, if there's any other food... uh, to get into probably anything with noodles, but probably pasta. Also selfishly because my son, he he, he will eat <laughs> any kind of noodle. Um, and so that makes my life easier. I love it. It's a great answer. I mean, there could be like a dried Italian crossover, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, in Montclair, New Jersey, there's pasta ramen. But oh, yeah. But guys at Montclair Hospital. That's right, right, right. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, they, Robbie there has his traditional Italian techniques, but we have... Some really fun noodles that he pairs with Love his that. pasta. So we've rooted this conversation all in the restaurant world, and that's a big part of your business. But you actually have you a CPG business. You sell actual ramen that we can get in the cooler case and on the shelf. So let me ask you, how can we buy Sun Noodle if maybe our local ramen shop doesn't carry you? Or just you want to buy another product? How do we buy it? What, is the, what are the products? Yeah, so we've always been making these uh, ramen kits uh, since I was growing up, uh, mostly sold in Asian grocery stores uh, you know, that, that you see locally, uh, Mitsua, you know, um, Sunrise Mart, uh, H Mart, 99 Ranch Market. And, and today, you know, we've been obviously fortunate because ramen shops are opening and so retailers are, are, are carrying fresh ramen kits. And so nationwide in Whole Foods, uh, Wegmans here on the East Coast. Uh, and, a lot, you know, that's, Probably yeah. our next part is like putting more focus and getting it more available online as well uh, on the Wii and on yeah. Wami Cart. And we also have our own store that we sell products on. So check it out. Check Sunday. it out. The website, I'll link to it for yeah. sure. So they're all they're all cold. They're all held in the cold, cold case. Yes. So they're either in the frozen section or refrigeration. Uh, but, you know, again, downstairs, I was surprised to see our kits downstairs. And even I'm always um, blown away by retailer is that that carry sun so sometimes yeah. that's amazing so look for it in the frozen or cooler case absolutely it's a great it's a great product um i think the ramen kit is is so fun 
you know, you, you, you can make a vegetable and make a side, but then you just throw that at the middle of the table. It's so good. Yeah, it's amazing because it's, it's maybe less than five minutes to prepare it, right? It's not that hard. You know, I think we're, we're trying to work a little bit harder on how do you make those barriers to like yeah. entry a little bit, um, just lower them and make them, make them more approachable. And that's either through recipes or videos. But yeah, within five minutes, you can prepare an amazing bowl of ramen at home. And, and you know, we, we love, we love so, they're fun, those so stories. Fun yeah. Ken, and this is Taste, who asks us about the discerning taste. So to close this interview, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Are you ready? Let's do it. The best fruit. Yep. Ooh. Being from Hawaii, you know, I think we're, we're fortunate. But one that I always eat is apple banana. Have you had an apple? Banana? I've never had an apple banana. <laughs> I don't think it's a hybrid of apple and banana, but uh, they're I think a lot. They're smaller than than your traditional banana, but they're super sweet mm. and and nice and just firm. But I, I grew up eating apple. Bananas. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've had those; they're amazing. I, I try to bring them back to uh, to New, New Jersey, but you, you can't take fruits out of Hawaii. You got to put a deep in your bag and just pray that they don't get taken. Yeah, or go to jail. So <laughs> I mean, that is breaking a federal law too. So. <laughs> Not from me, you didn't hear that. Okay. Yeah. The worst vegetable. I'm getting better at vegetables yeah. know, across, but the, uh, celery, I, yeah. I've just never, I, mean, I don't need the celery. I, yeah. I don't get it. People are like, you can use the, the leaves and salads. And yeah. I know people will be like, man, I used celery this morning. It was yeah. so good. The best dessert. For our wedding anniversary, my wife makes uh, an amazing Japanese uh, strawberry shortcake. Uh, and also I love, uh, have you ever had halpia pie in Hawaii? No, I haven't. It's a coconut cream pie and, um, it's like, I guess it's, it's, it's somewhat firm, yeah. but, uh, I love coconut. So it's a, it's a coconut cream and there's also like a crust, but it's just full of flavor. And I know this, I've had this, I had this at like, um, a, a, a poke spot, like a umekes on the okay. big island. That's okay. what I remember. Yeah. Probably halpia pie, but yeah, yeah it's delicious. Or that, sorry. The, yeah, exactly what you said. Yeah. Um, good answer. I like that. Uh, your favorite New York City restaurant right now? Yeah, having having two young ones, you know, it's it's not yeah. easy to get out there. But I, but I got to uh, dine at Kono last week. Mm. Uh, yakitori Kono and um, yeah. Are you do you do you like yakitori the skewered meats and of course yeah so Kono San we're was, right around the corner from Toto. It's right, right here. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Kono San was previously at uh, Torishin. Oh yeah, sure. and um, what I love about not just the food, but you know, he's designed his restaurant. So he's in the middle, like a stage and we're sitting around him and he has hip hop and some of the best food. So I enjoyed that. Fun. I love that yeah. answer. Your favorite American fast food chain. I love Taco Bell. <laughs> My guy. Same. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Can I, can I just tell you something? Because yeah. we don't have too many Mexican restaurant options in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, so we were first introduced through, um, I just love Taco Bell. Yeah. And my sister and I, we just will eat that all day long. It's it's truly one of uh, God's gifts. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, a couple more. This is fun. So your favorite cookbook of all time. It's it's not a cookbook, but I, I loved, uh, I, I, I it's 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 on my desk. It's uh, it's James Freeman's Blue Bottle um, Craft Coffee Book. And I just love everything about how he teaches you about the, the, the deep history of coffee and, and the craftsmanship and how to make a better espresso. And it's just really beautiful to see that book. And I, I, I gotta tell you, when when we did Ramen Lab and we talked about craft ramen, a lot of that was inspired by That's so cool. what, what he's done in his book. So it's it's on my table. That's so great. James has been a guest. I actually saw him recently huh? in Ojai. Really? Uh, he's a friend, yeah. And oh. um, you're a real coffee head. I, I'm, inspired, I'm, I'm inspired by how they've taken that third wave coffee movement yeah, and, and, and get people excited about coffee. And hopefully we can see some of that in ramen really or, cool. from instant to what we're seeing today, the craft ramen. Would you finish uh, a bowl of like uh, a ramen with like a pour over, like a coffee with like a hot coffee? Uh, Would you pair the two together? Not, not necessarily. <laughs> but during ramen meetings, right, we would eat a lot of ramen, and then we would get some coffee after. Yeah, you kind of, yeah you, it's in, in, in play, but you're, you're like, eh, maybe not. But, but there is a ramen shop in Tokyo that, uh, what is it called, the pour over? Yeah, pour over, yeah. So they put dashi in that, and yeah. they pour over the, the soup, and then that's the broth. And so, yeah, there's a lot of that's fun. I like expression that. there, yeah. Your favorite city outside of America to visit for food? Oh, Tokyo. Yeah. Tokyo, for sure. Absolutely. Hands down. Yeah. Hands down. Um, the a cuisine you would like to learn more about? You know, I, I live in Jersey City, so uh, there's a lot of Indian restaurants, and um, 
we have I have a colleague that's from India from um, Gujarati so he's introduced me to a lot of Indian food but then last week I got to visit another friend uh, who's from a different part of India and completely different dishes and so uh, I, I love Indian food. I, I think I should just learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, amazing answer. Yeah. You live in a, like a mecca of Indian food yeah. in, in the East Coast. And so whenever my sister comes in town, my mom, we're, we're getting Indian food for them. So cool. Yeah. Last one, your favorite sandwich. I like a good French dip. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Just There's a brothy element, so it makes sense. That's why. Maybe that's why, but yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. Like, like a refined a broth. You know, you need to have uh, that element, right? It's, I, two, it's yeah. two parts. Yeah, that's Nice texture on the bread Love and, it. you know, melty. do you have any recommendations in, in New York City? You know, I, I actually, it's a real stumper. Mm-hmm. I think of it as more like Midwest, okay. I, but yeah, none. Yeah. Well, if you have any, please. I'm going to hit you on the gram. I'm going to definitely let you know if I knew about a French dip, but that's a great answer. I like that. Thank you. Kinshiro Uki, thank you so much for joining This Is Taste. What's up, Eliza? How are you? I'm good, Matt. How are you doing? I mean, we were just doing a little deep meditation in the studio before we got on, so we're like a little, little more low-key right now. Yeah, I don't know if we've ever been this chill, but maybe we can talk about some of our three things and get excited again. I think we're going to like ramp up the energy of three things. What's your first one? My first thing is that I recently made the Black Sesame Rice Krispie Treats that Eric Kim developed oh, for the Times. Yeah, Eric, I, I made this oh. myself as well. So let's kind of break it down. How'd yours go? Uh, mine were great. I really like the fact that there's sesame oil and sesame seeds that go into them. So it has this kind of double toasty yeah. note. And I also just realized how much I love Rice Krispie treats and that it's not something that I eat enough. Oh, me either. And I think when you add black sesame and kind of has like a cool look and then, of course, adding the sesame oil is a classic Eric Kim pastry move. Um, I brought it to a Super Bowl party and folks were like, huh, Rice Krispie treats, huh, they're black. And then they're like, whoa, these are great. Wow, I love that you brought them to a Super Bowl party. I think I would be more likely to watch the Super Bowl if there were Rice Krispie treats there. I know, and I, I brought the, his butter mochi as well, which also had black sesame, so it was like a one-two Eric Kim punch. Love it. Not good so for anyone good. with a sesame allergy, but good for me. Sorry, I, I was definitely not thinking about the sesame aller- allergic folks out there. It's all good. What's your first thing? My first thing is I went to a new restaurant, Kanya Kumari, this Tamil Nadu restaurant in Flatiron. With, uh, I went with Priya and um, I had a dish that I've never had, pasayam. Do you know this dish? No, it's, tell me about it. It's a South Indian dessert, typically made with vermicelli, milk, dried fruits, and flavored with cardamom. That's like There's like many versions, but that's like the baseline. But this one was made with a brulee pineapple. And I thought it was terrific. And young coconut as well is like in the in the pudding. And it's like really one of my favorite pastries this year. The combination of uh, of young coconut, like milk and 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 just like the lightness to it. And it was just a perfect end to a, a really terrific meal. I think this restaurant is like really one of our best ones, new ones of the year. Well, I have to check it out. That sounds great. What's your next one? My next one is that, are you familiar with the pasta tarot deck? I'm loving this. No, I'm not familiar, but I'm loving this. Uh, Well, I think it's actually being re-released by Penguin Random House this spring, but it came out for the first time last year, and it is a full, like, uh, traditional 78-card tarot deck with all the major and minor arcana, but everything is being represented by a different shape or style of pasta, which really just hits on two of my main interests, which are pasta and pulling tarot for my friends. (laughs) Uh, And I think it's just super fun and creative and also just showcases, like, how many different kinds of pasta are out there. So I think that like if somebody was looking for maybe a gift for someone you know traditionally you're not supposed to buy your own tarot decks yeah. not everyone ascribes to that but i just think the pasta tarot deck is super cool i love this pick and i wonder um, when you're reading tarot for your friends does it get a little heated does it get a little emotional yeah you know I, people have different takes on that there are some folks i think people who are like more practiced with reading tarot often won't do readings for their friends because they don't want to get in that situation but for me it's more of like a casual way to kind of connect with my friends and often if they're having a hard time or if there's something coming up in the future that they feel nervous about like we'll pull together and then kind of use the cards as a way to reflect and talk about it so yeah. i think if you're nosy like me and or don't feel particularly like connected to the universe but just using tarot as a 
a social connection also like me, then it's a really nice way to go about it. But I'm sure there will be some people listening that would say that I shouldn't be doing this for my friends. So apologies. Well said, man. Well, I, I like the, your point of view with tarot. I've, I've never really quite understood it, but you just broke it down. I'll bring you. Beautifully. Maybe I'll get the pasta tarot deck and we can. Are we going to do a reading? Yeah. Live on the air. Oh, my God. No, please. No. <laughs> What's your next thing? My next one is I went to the new Mel Bakery location in Hudson, New York, up in uh, upstate. And it was really good. So Mel had an original location in the Lower East Side around Dime Square. They moved up to Hudson in the past six months. And I've been meaning to go and we were, found ourselves up in Hudson. Shout out to Cafe Mutton and went there as well, which is great. And I, I was so blown away by everything from the multiple types of breads they were doing for the day to, I mean, the Queen Amman, uh, Vanisserie, you know, flaky sheeted pastry that you will see in most places in New York or, or reputable bakeries. They're, they're nailing that. But then they did focaccia and sandwiches. So they did like a, a focaccia of the day, which had this really tomatoey um, sauce. And then they had, I think it was mortadella. I can't remember like what lunch and meat it was, but on some of their fresh bat bread, just a terrific bakery. Yeah, I really loved going to the Mel location on the Lower East Side. I think they do a lot of savory breakfast pastries really well, which yeah. is something that is a special interest of mine. And I was really sad when they closed. So I'm glad to hear that they opened um, upstate and that I can go get them up there. Yeah. Seek them on Hudson. What's your last one? My last one is a food novel, which, as people know, is another special interest of mine. Yeah. It's called Happy. It's by Selena Belgit Basra. And it's about a like Punjabi cabbage farmer who has aspirations of being like a movie star who immigrates to Europe. And I just think the food writing in this book is really special. There's a lot of descriptions of things like sugar roti that just sound like really delicious and special. There's a whole section that's like being written from the perspective of a tree. Like it's a very unusual book. Um, but I think that anyone who's interested in food narratives or just kind of great writing in general would want to check it out. Can we get the author on? Uh, yeah, she is based in Berlin, but I bet she could do a Zoom thing. So Maybe we should do it. We'll figure it out. Great. What's your last thing? My last one is a book. It's coming out, I believe, in May. might be April. Don't quote me. It's called The Bartender's Pantry by Jim Meehan, who, you know, everyone knows Jim. He was the founder of PDT in the East Village in New York, a real legend in the cocktail game. Now, Jim has done this, like, very – it's almost pocket-sized book about – really building your home bar and kitchen. And I just think it's the kind of book that it follows up on his PDT cocktail classics book, which is a lot of like the history of the bar. Well, this is like his follow-up. And I, I love that he is doing all sorts of drinks with real home cooking in mind. Masala milk tea punch. He's got a gin basil smash. I'm just like actually literally paging through it now. Um, and I just love the way it kind of fits into the pocket almost. And it, it's it's one of the books that I know you're going to see in lots of lists. And I just loved seeing Jim back in the game where he's going to be on the podcast soon. And I just love it. Well, it sounds great. Thanks for talking about three things. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening.